Well, like, okay, that exact story that you just told is my life. Yeah, well, I don't know that much about either of your stories, really. Mm. So I'll probe the questions in the right direction. Oh, I love telling it. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. <laughs> it's probably a good thing we don't know. But that's why you love what you do. Yeah. Because it's obviously had such a powerful impact on your life and well-being. Unrecognisable difference in my life. Yeah. Unrecognisable. Cool. Mm. Well, I should probably introduce you to everyone, seeing as we're already rolling. So we've got Ella Pike here and Nathan Freeman from the newly opened Breath House in, is it Windsor or Pram? It's Windsor. Windsor. You're officially Windsor, that side of uh, High Street. So my neighbours, what, would be probably, what, 400 metres away from each other? Jeez, About probably that. not even. Yeah. <laughs> About 200 metres across High Street. It's the place to be for health and well-being. That's right. It is. It is. It's the street to be So off. congratulations, firstly, on opening it up because that's a huge, uh, huge step and from somebody who's opened two gyms. I understand what goes into the renovations, the fit-outs, the stresses, the dealing with council, the timelines, the project management and all the shit that goes into it. How was the experience of getting it from concept idea into open facility? I guess I'll, I'll start with that <laughs> yeah, because that's been sort of my domain over the last six months. But Are you sort telling of me you're not that good on the tools? I'm terrible on the tools. <laughs> She's been all I right. I just sit she in the corner and cry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's helpful. <laughs> just stresses us all. Yeah, it gets in the way. Yeah. Well, I'm not much help either. But no, we probably about six months ago, we had sort of came up with the idea. Um, it was 130 days from the day we first had our sauna and discussed it to the day that we opened. Yeah. That's where the idea originated from, from in the sauna. So it in happened very quickly. That's a great thinking space, the sauna. It is. Mm. It is. Um, so yeah, we probably yeah six months ago um, and yeah, found a space. We were very lucky. We found our space pretty quickly, um, got in there. And yeah, then it was just like, uh, as you said before, like almost just project managing, sparkies. Um, There's no almost about chippies. it. Chippies. It's a hundred percent. Oh, it was, it was full time. Like we were almost working, like we're on the computer till 1am every morning and then we're back at the studio at 6am letting the sparkies in to go in and do their thing. And mm -hmm. um, we're actually still getting a few lights and, and fittings put right in today. Now, so right now. I actually, I really like your red lighting. Oh, it changes. It's not just red dials. It's red, it's okay. green, it's pink. It's whatever you want it to be. Well, I'm doing a renovation mm. here soon. Yeah. And I'm going to get your supplier for your lighting because I'm going to add in our own sauna and ice bath in here too, which amazing. will be cool. It's amazing, yeah. So we, we, we didn't have any ideas about what we... We had a sort of a, a framework about what we wanted the space to look like, but then our sparkies, yeah, got us onto the company that supplied our lighting and we were like, this is amazing. It's something different. It sort of adds just to like a whole sensory experience of what breathwork is and you know in itself and and just to add like that external like we're in a basement so it's very like intimate you're almost like in a cocoon and everyone always thinks about like the basement there's no lighting there's no i mean there's no windows there's no like sunlight and everyone's like oh and everyone has the same feeling in their body which i did when nathan first sent me the link i was like no way and then you go in and it's perfect. But I understand that in a way that it, there's probably a, a, an element of vulnerability in what you guys do, especially for your newer clients that aren't maybe accustomed to that setting, that there's probably, a, it's quite nice to feel unseen maybe in the dim lighting. 100%. And lighting's huge. I mean, I've obviously put a bit of effort into the lighting in this place as well, yeah. but it sets such a tone. Yeah, that's right. So that's what we try to do. And it's, uh, yeah, it's come up really well. We've had some really good feedback on the lights and... Um, and we're already pivoting and changing things. We're doing renovations again. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So now we're just, it's sort what of. What, uh, are the, what are the changes? What are you, what have you changed your mind on? We're going to have a sauna and yeah. we've decided that saunas ain't it because all of our classes have wait lists. So we're going to change, you're the first to hear about this. Um, now we're going to change the structure of our classroom and turn our current sauna room into my one-on-one -on -one room and then expand nice. our ca classroom. Well, that's your core offering. If that's, that's going right. to give you greatest ROI, yeah. that makes sense from a business perspective. Yeah, we, we sort of thought it, our core business is breath work with a breath house. Um, and while saunas and ice bars, whatever, would be nice to have, it's not a need to have. Like we're, our core business is breath work and we solely focus on that. So we do have a sauna in there at the moment, but it's not, you know, it's probably just going to get used by us, I guess. But um, no, that's it. And we can put all our focus into the breath work side of it and make mm. that, you know, a1 and the best breathwork experience you can get, you know, I'd hopefully in no Australia. I have no doubts over that at all, mm. but definitely some collaboration opportunities coming up. We've got the saunas and the ice bars, the breathwork. They go hand in hand. They're basically cousins, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. I, I think before we do any collabs, you've got to come and lay down. I do. Yeah. I do. You've been pushing me yeah, for I a while for to a do so. Now. But <laughs> um, there are some things I actually want to discuss with you when we finish the podcast, because I know you want to do your gym membership here. 100%, yeah. So we can look after one another in that space. Yeah. Mm. I'm... Um, 
not the most social person sometimes. I don't like big groups. Maybe I'm a bit precious. Want to do the one-on-one. We one can on do a one-on-one. One. Yeah. I would actually prefer to do a one-on-one. Okay, with good. You, why, why are you smirking at me? Like you think know. you're going to unpack something, huh? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, we'll, we'll talk about that off camera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nathan, I want to start with you, man. Because um, I, as I first reached out to you and hadn't actually met you yet, but just knew you through Ella and saw the space and you guys teaming up together. And I just think it's really cool to see a male figure stepping into that space um, as, you know, even a younger version of myself, if you'd sort of suggested these kinds of things to me, I would have boo-hooed them away, you know, pretty quickly. But having, you know, experienced elements of, you know, that type of mindfulness and breathwork exercises themselves and understand the science and the benefits of it all, I think it's a really positive movement giving, you know, even in, I guess, my professional life, the demographic of people that I'm working with at the moment, there's just an overwhelming amount of suffering, particularly in um, young men. So I think it's just awesome to see another dude pushing into that space. And then you've obviously got your background in footy and you've gone through the AFL system. So, you know, can you take me back to, I guess, just what your journey's been in, obviously from, you know, finishing your school studies, finding your way into the AFL system, no longer on the AFL list? No, no longer on the AFL. Talk, talk to me through about, if you don't mind sharing about just the emotional roller coaster of that journey as well to how you found yourself where you are now. Yeah, so we'll sort of swing it all the way back to 2013. I was in year 12, finished school. Um, as the AFL system works, you get drafted when you're, when you're 18. And yep. It's probably about a, a week after my year 12 exams, you find yourself at an AFL footy club and you are straight into full-time work. I think the first week at, you know, I got originally got drafted to Collingwood, my first week of training, the boys went off on schoolies. So I'm waking up at six o'clock to go to training and I'm getting Snapchats and photos from all the boys and surfers going to schoolies. So it happens very quickly. So you don't really get much time to, um, to breathe after exams, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so then straight into the AFL system, was at Collingwood for two years. I tore my hamstring quite badly in my first game against Geelong um, at Collingwood. Missed the whole year. Did it again in my second year. Missed the whole year again. So, you know, hamstring surgeries, reattachments, that sort of stuff. Um, Which is a very common story of the AFL list. I think the average career spans for like 18 months from everyone who gets drafted. Yeah, it's 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 a bloody hard system and industry. Um, and it's, it's very cutthroat in terms of, um, you know, like you said, the, the average know playing career is yeah like say two three years yeah it might have Um, stretched out yeah and and even then like it's it yeah it doesn't last forever and you've always uh, clubs are really good now at you know getting players um set for life after footy even while they're in the game now they're encouraging them to go out and and spread their wings and and find passions and things outside of football just for education 100 percent. so even from when i got drafted to now it's it's it was really good when I got drafted, but even till now, it's it's amazing what what clubs do and the and the you know welfare and pro, um, procedures they have in place. Um, but yeah, so I, I missed pretty much two whole years with hamstring um, injuries. Got traded to St Kilda, yep. spent three years at St Kilda. Still had lingering hamstring issues, so I could never really get on the park um, in any sort of you know long term capacity. I was always in and out. Did a did a shoulder, had a shoulder reco, did a syndesmosis. Um, so I was just doing injuries left, right and centre. And then I ended up getting delisted in a 2018. So I had two years at Collingwood, three years at St Kilda. Um, went straight into player management. Mm-hmm. So probably halfway through my 2018 season, um, my manager sort of approached me and said, you know, if it doesn't work out at the end of this year, I'd love to have you on um, as a manager because sort of my journey through my five years of my career. Was that a bittersweet conversation even just to have, to be like, well, you've obviously got some doubts in your mind about whether I'm going to go on, but I appreciate the forethought and opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, it was a little bit. A bit but I, <laughs> to be honest, I could probably see the writing on the wall. Like, I'm a bit of a realist. Like, uh, not many players last five years in the system. Statistically, you can look at that. I haven't been playing. 100%. It's, it's, it's I, w- I, was, I was, you know, pushing shit uphill, like, in that last year, just yeah. to get, like, I did my shoulder, um, probably round four in the VFL and I missed, I, w- I meant to have surgery on it. So I did a grade four AC joint 
needed to have surgery, but I just played through it throughout the year because I just needed to play to get another contract. So yeah. I just I was playing with a bung shoulder. I was. Did you get cortisones or anything to keep that? Going? Yeah, I was. Oh mate, that year was like I was getting it jabbed to numb it for trainings, and then strapping it, and throughout the week I was in a sling. Like it was just, it was comical. And, and mate, I don't think people in the general population understand the no. sacrifice that people put on their body to keep playing at the elite level Absolutely. of sport in general. That's right. Like, even, you know, what, we're at what, round eight or nine in the AFL season, There's you'd be hard-pressed to find a player that's not playing through some sort of niggle or injury at the moment. Yep. Um, yeah, like, the, the week-to-week... Like, play, the general public only see players for the two hours on the weekend when they play, mm-hmm. but there's, you know, the other, you know, seven, six days of the week where they don't see players, you know, icing, you know, getting, you know, jabs, getting physio, getting out of the track, doing all this stuff just to get them up for that two hours and then the public just judge them on that. And since the uh, sort of the, the schedule has shifted over the last few years as well, so sometimes you've got the shorter turnarounds too. Absolutely, like it might, yeah. It's not seven, once every seven days. Yeah. It might be once every four or five days. Yeah, so Collingwood, when they play on Anzac Day, they played four days later against Adelaide and it's... That's brutal. Oh, it's, it's only just then when you just start to feel... 100%. A little bit better. It's short. And then the short weeks are... You pretty much just recovery. You're not you're not training. You might go out for a little touch session, but clubs are really good now. Like there's so much technology in terms of like GPS. Like they do, you know, blood testing to see the the levels of muscle damage in your body and all this sort of stuff. So they're so you know clued up about how players are feeling in their you know you know bodies after their games, and mm. they can tailor their weeks towards that. So a um, little bit off tra- off track, but yeah, I finished up, went into player management, um, was in there for five years with. Connors Sports, so Paul Connors was my manager. Um, Yeah, managed, you know, probably 25 to 30 players um, all up until probably October last year where I left the company, sort of wanted to branch out. I'd sort of been in the AFL system for, you know, know, semi-professional level footy since I was 16 really um, and wanted to, you know, take, um, you know, do a few other different passions where it's, you know, property, some wellness stuff. Um, I'm in another company with, my mate Charlie Crozio, it's called Volley, it's launching soon. So, um, yeah, just a lot of different things that I wanted to do, sort of expand out of the AFL industry. Um, yeah, so then I got, uh, met Ella probably about, when was it, probably September, October last year. Um, and all I knew her as the breath boss, which she still is. Um, and, yeah, like like amazing person. First, first time we met, I was, yeah, like everyone gets drawn to her as soon as you meet her. Um, Tell the story about the first thing I ever did. Oh, yeah. This, <laughs> but how did you meet Ella? Oh, was this at a breathwork session? Were you out socially? What was happening? So her? I was working at a gym. This is a very gym. funny story. And I was on my lunch break. Oh, okay. So so she used to work at a, at a gym, which um, I you know, started going to. And we're sitting in the sauna. Me and my few mates were in our speedos, like sweating the house down. And Ella's working there. She's on her lunch break. So she's, I'm like, who's, who's this girl? She walks into the sauna. She's got trackies on, a hoodie. She's eating prawns. And she walks into the she walks into the sauna, and I'm I'm thinking, who the hell is this girl? But like, one of the like nicest people, like just bubbly, and obviously Charlie, my mate, I was with knew her beforehand, so they were getting chatting, and I was like, eating prawns in the sauna. She was eating prawns in the sauna. We see you remained in the sauna. She was stayed in the sauna. Full you, you, you were just enjoying the um the, scenery, the visuals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. Just, I can understand. Just that. the social yep. social side of it, but yeah, <laughs> having lunch. Yep. Just having lunch. And then, yeah, then we just became mates. And, um, you started coming to Breathwork? I stu- yeah. So she pulled me and Charlie to a Breathwork class one Sunday night. And like you were saying before, like I'm you know, a 28, 27-year-old bloke. I've never been um, exposed to the, the spiritual transformation. Yeah, despite all of that kind of recovery, yeah. you hadn't seen the we'd d- we'd, I'd done some um, Breathwork stuff with a few high-performance coaches in terms of but that's a different style. It'd perform- be like hyperventilation yeah. and amp up performance. That's right. Hyper arousal. Perform- yeah. yeah, the performance side of it, which I really take to now. Like, oh, I love doing that stuff. Um, but never the transform- transformative side of it, which Ella is obviously the best at. Um, so, yes, yeah, so laid down. Had no idea what I was getting myself into. And pretty much after the session, I was like, this stuff is wild. I don't know how. I'd never heard of it before. Blokes I know that, you know, 90% of the public or people that I don't know would never have heard of breath work. Mm-hmm. And knowing Ella, she's amazing at what she does, but I'm like, this needs to get out there more. Not very good at business. <laughs> no, <laughs> she's good now. She's very good now. But at the time, I was like, she needs to you know, get her gift out to more people and hit more of the you public. You can see the benefit of teaming up together. 100%. So uh, we just got chatting and then 
she'd obviously always wanted to eventually get a studio and her own sort of business and i was in that sort of part of my life where i was you know looking for, for your new ventures yeah something to do and it sort of just worked like we get on really well it's sort of it's such a good partnership like her strengths are my weaknesses my strengths are her weaknesses it sort of just works really well um, yeah it's a good balance and i think this with the whole breath work side of it um like you said it's blokes like us we'd look at breath work and, and what, what's out there now it's very yeah like woo woo very you know spiritual oriented orientated whereas i look at it i'm like this is just amazing for mental health performance general population getting benefits out of it i was like why like if we can tailor our you know offerings in our studio to those people who have never heard of it let's get them in and because everyone can if you've got a set of lungs you're, like, you're going to see benefit out of breath work so can you explain to me your thought process and your experiences in that first breath work session like what did you you said it felt amazing yeah. it was amazing but what happened so i'd dabbled in meditation in yoga in some mindfulness stuff but my my, my brain and you could probably relate goes at a million miles an hour like it, I, I never stop i'm always thinking of something um very active person and none of those things ever clicked with me i'd never seen much benefit out of the yoga i could never switch off but i found like after that hour i literally woke like not woke up but I, at the end of the session i was like that felt like five minutes but it was an hour of like you're just so deeply meditative i'm like my brain switched off for an hour and i find that now with a lot of the footy players that come in they go I, i've never like just had been still for an hour and had no thoughts and completely switched off um, how much of that do you think is just tied into um i guess the commonality of like pleasure seeking and distraction because we're just surrounded by it yeah 100 percent. Allah always drills it into me and i like by admission like i'm no i'm not the best at it still but it's it's one of those things where you, you practice it and you get better at it but it's that uncomfortable stillness of just you and your breath and the sound bowls and Allah's guided meditations and, and guided breath work. Um, yeah, it's, it's getting comfortable with being still where I'd never, and a lot of guys can relate. We never have the time. And girls. That and girls. That yeah. was my first experience. Yeah. I was like, fuck this. And then boom. That's right. So so tell me about your first experience because this kind of started with you, but you found breath work through a bit of personal suffering. To say the least. Um, no, I, had a very lovely, my life was chaos. Um, and I just spent my whole life from as soon as I could. Now I understand it as I always just wanted to control the feeling I was feeling. So I was always running from something. I was always numbing. I was always partying the hardest, taking the most drugs, the most Valium, sleeping, all that kind of stuff. Like I was that, I was that girl. And I moved to Melbourne and I had my Britney Spears moment, which... Um, Is that a full breakdown? Yeah, full nervous breakdown. Just Ended to clarify. up in a psych ward. Yep. Was running up and down <laughs> Barker Street in queue, trying to stab myself, trying to stab my ex. Did laying you really? in traffic. <laughs> yeah. Wow, this is yeah. a lot more interesting than I expected. Yeah, full I would have loved moment. to see that. Yeah, it was interesting. There's a few people there that still hang out with me um, that laugh about it now. We all laughed about it the other night at the opening. Oh, his um, stories come up all the time. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not surprised anymore. If so someone still loves you after those moments, though, that's you, right. know, you know they're the real deal. Yeah, that's exactly, right. exactly. Um, anyway, so I, that sent me home to Byron and that sent me through six weeks of talk therapy and unpacking home the mental to Byron, Byron's yeah. where you come from so Byron I grew up in Byron yep. moved to Melbourne when I was 23 um so moved I went back to Byron for six weeks found an unbelievable psychologist who helped me unpack the what like understand and intellectualize why I was showing up the way I was in my life was that the first time you'd had a psychologist no I'd been in and out of psychologists since year four but I think that's counselor. the um that's but the thing is that a lot of people say find the right person. Yeah, she instead of, I would be telling her a story and you know how the, oh, I don't know if you guys know, but the first session is always like you just telling your life story. To feel it. And it's like, there you go, here. And then another hour is now the teenage years and then this and then that. And then this lady, her name's Jane, she was, she'd stop me and she'd be like, so the reason you show up like this now is because of this happened to you when you were younger. And I was like, what? And then she just helped me understand and she helped me put in like practices to like, isn't Stop it myself. amazing how when you can connect the dots about where something's coming from and now you just understand it, it just immediately takes air out of the tires. It was, and I came back to Melbourne and I was like, oh, I'm healed, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> and I was all, I was, a, I was a different person. I was. Yeah, I was different. I, I wasn't it. like, I, I came off Xanax, which is the hardest thing I ever had to do because I was having like three or four a day. And Bricks? Yeah. Ooh. Every day. First thing in the morning with an energy drink, lunchtime, nighttime with a 
bong or with a joint <laughs> or a glass of wine. Like I was, oh. I was the most low vibrational person that there could have been. There'd be some um, blur, like blurry kilos memories as well. of that yeah. time then, for sure. Because yeah. and this is coming. Cause Annie's are like the men in black. Just yeah. Boosh. But then this is also coming off two years before I m- a year before I moved to Melbourne. I was in a coma in London with encephalitis. You know encephalitis? No. Like meningitis, like okay. a, sp- a spinal fluid and brain fluid infection that ended up. They put me into an induced coma. So you so were like burning really the needle. The we're burning the wick yeah. at both ends. Yeah. So I went, came back t- from um, Byron where I found this unreal psychologist and I was all healed and I was all different and I wasn't doing all the things that I was doing. And then we, my ex and I broke up at the start, end of 2019 and I went to buy more Zannies and my friends like, try breath work. And I was like, shut up, Maddie. You've known me my whole life. Like, don't try and suggest breath work. But and isn't that the perfect example of how when things go bad, we go seeking pleasure? Yeah, to I went straight to that. The happiness that's not there. Yeah, sure. I went yeah. straight to that, and then I had a zani one of the nights. I had half one, and I felt amazing again. And then the next day, I woke up, and another friend from Melbourne sent me a full moon release, like a big breathwork session. And I was like, "Fuck, two friends in one like twenty four hours. I'll try it." And I laid down on my bed, and it was on Zoom, and I laughed my head off at the woman. Like, we were in a group Zoom, and I was just thinking, this bitch sounds crazy. Like, this bitch is talking about how your body's going to react and what's going to happen and all the things that I say, like clockwork. Like, I could say just – I say it four times a day now. Mm -hmm. And I was laying in bed and laughing at her, just thinking this is bullshit. And then I promised myself that I would try it, and I would just give it everything, and I would just try my hardest for the hour and a half, and I did, and it was the most – insanely beautiful but uncomfortable and revolting but amazing experience in my life so it sounds like it clicked for both of you sort of first time experiencing it is Mm. that normal or can it sometimes take people a few times to be able to lean into it and find you know the benefit of the exercise itself so what i've found now since doing this full time for a hot minute now i've realized that if you come to a class and you don't have that profound first time experience. So say you come to, um, say someone who's like really highly strung, who like has endometriosis and doesn't drink coffee because their nervous system's too wired and they're all like this kind, they show up like that, right? If they come to a heightened class, like a release style class where it's all mouth breathing and all sympathetic, they're not gonna have a crazy experience because that's their level, you Mm -hmm. know? But if they were to come to LSD where it's just light, slow, very parasympathetic, they're gonna have a profound experience because they're finally feeling safe in their body. Does LSD stand for something in terms of breath work or is that, okay, so it's got nothing to do with the psychedelic drug? But it it hooks you, right? It makes you go, what? But I only ask that, not from being a smart ass, but rather (laughs) understanding that breath work can bring out some similarities to psychedelic It can also in a take way. you 100%. to a psychedelic place, but I think the longer sessions are a little bit more psychedelic rather than the classes. But like everyone has that, if you don't have that really profound first time experience, I think that you've probably just gone to a class that's not best suited to the way your nervous system shows up. Mm-hmm. So I think that if you haven't had like that crazy what the hell moment the first time, which doesn't always have to be like emotional. Like for me, it was emotional. For Nath, I think it was probably just like stillness. Mm. But if you haven't had that the first time, I think it's just about finding what route to go down because there's so many different ways it's, a, it's also breathe. understanding what your body what your breathing can do to your body um once you go to a few classes and you, and you understand the feelings that you get with different types of breath like you know our structures are classes yeah like to put you in a parasympathetic state or another class can put you in a sympathetic state and you can pull different levers to change the biochemistry of your body mm-hmm. um and the more you do it the more you understand it and then that translates to daily life where you're like, okay, like I'm feeling really wide up. I'm going to start taking some really deep, slow belly breaths and bring yourself back to parasympathetic. So it's all just learning and bringing yourself into your body. And the more that people come in, they understand and they and they even go deeper into the experience because they lean into it more. But yeah, it's all, it's all understanding about what your breathing can do to your body in yeah. terms of relaxation or heightened states or oh, i get it yeah. so much i mean it's it's such a common thing that again i'm not as probably uh qualified to talk on the matter as what you two are but i understand the basics of obviously yeah. breathing you're you know pretty well versed. We, we breathe somewhere between what 70 seventeen thousand and thirty thousand breaths a day yep. somewhere between what eight and twelve a minute ideally yep. you've obviously got the option you know, between going through your nose minute. and mouth supposed to be the original healthy amount yeah and then right. with time we've just instead of like looking at why we're breathing more we've just started increasing the normal 
And there's just so many factors that change the way that people breathe. And yep. I think, again, time on their phone, postural stress and all of that, sort of bringing the head forward, now their mouth breathing, and they're not even aware of it. You know, 100%. And, and you wonder where, why people are sort of stuck in this sympathetic state yep. or that they can't create. Like my, one of my most hated things that people say in gyms is like, turn on your core. <laughs> yeah. Where do, where do I do that? Yeah. Like, unless you actually teach me what the fuck that means. And everybody can squeeze a bicep. Like, we did that as little boys. Yeah. But to actually learn how to neurologically coordinate your diaphragm with your breath is a very hard thing to do. Yeah. And unless you've practiced it, you probably can't do it. Yeah, there's a lot There's a lot of, you know, we've done a, an oxygen advantage course. I've done an XPT course. It's like, there's so much in terms of the yeah, like spinal bracing for um, heavy compound lifts. Yep. And there's there's so much more than the parasympathetic synthetic state getting you in a different... It's like there's breathing for when you're sprinting. There's breathing that can help you, yeah, turn on your diaphragm and, and you know, yeah, like protect your spine with your, your core in terms of different breathing techniques. So, yeah, it's it's the more you dive into it, the more you go, wow, this everything's really connected. The, it's, the, it's the link between the mind and the body, really. Well, it's our life force. It's the only thing we can't live without. And my favourite thing to remind people of is like... I've got another story to tell you about diaphragm, but hold on. My favorite thing to remind everyone is, is like you pay attention to your steps, your water, your fats, your calories, your exercise, all this shit, and then your chest breathing and mouth breathing. But they and look over like that because it's autonomous. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's they're right. like, yeah. But it should still be conscious. And that's yeah. the thing. People lose their conscious awareness of where their breath is going. And you talked about it in terms of like your life and your thoughts and your, you know, your brain, I suppose, capacity. Mm. Well, again, like your sinuses are responsible for producing 60 to 70% of the nitric oxide in your body. That's so right. That's, that's essential for acetylcholine production, blood flow, vasodilation, sexual arousal, digestion, 100%. like the list really goes on. And I think it's, it's just such a cool thing that people are starting to become more aware of. So you've mentioned to the LSD and you mentioned, what was the other one? Release. The release. What other styles of breathwork technique do you use at the breath house? So there's th we have three classes at the moment, but we will have a fourth class coming. So we have a new have facilitator, no yeah. um, starting on Friday. But at the moment, there's LSD, which is probably the most gentle and mm. the softest. And I mean, every time you lay down to do breath work, your body's going to pull forward the experience that you want to pull forward. Like even though I might facilitate a class that's all nose breathing and supposed to just be very grounding and delicious, it might be super emotional for you because that's what your body wants to bring forward for you, right? So every time you lay down to do it, it will be what you need. But LSD is designed to be the beginner's class because it is very gentle in the way that it's all in through the nose and out of the mouth or out of the nose. Mm -hmm. um, release is a little nose breathing at the start, a little nose breathing at the end, and the middle is predominantly mouth breathing with like some different plays on breath holds. Mm -hmm. Same with LSD. Um, not so many breath holds in the LSD. And then Connect is a spicy combo of both of them, but Connect is actually how I was facilitating classes when I first met Nathan. And... We start with a exercise that isn't breathing and it's actually eye gazing. <laughs> so you Kay. partner up with a stranger and you speak to the stranger for a few minutes and break the ice and then you sit in the... Does it take people straight back to like high school? Yeah, shit. it's real uncomfortable. <laughs> it's so uncomfortable. It's yeah. so uncomfortable, but that's the point. Like you, we don't do that. A lot of so many people, like, I, I mean, the people that I surround myself with are pretty good at enga like engaging in human connection and that like general, you know, like... Be a lot of people struggle to hold eye contact these days. Mm. But also, like, after COVID and after the last two years, some people... That's magnified. You know, they, they live in their house by themselves. They work behind a desk. They they go to the gym and it's like an F45-style class where there's no, there's no talking or they go to the gym by themselves and then they don't have any connection. There's no actual genuine connection mm. and with anyone and anything. And so they sit down and they stare into the eyes of a stranger and it's emotional. Like, it's strange. It's uncomfortable. It's sucks for a hot second but then you realize that like it's just a mirror to the experience that you're having and it's it, we're all the same and there's energy is very contagious isn't yeah it? exactly so connect is paired with watch no one come to connect the water so you do <laughs> this <laughs> in a seated position facing one another yeah. and the others are laying down no, so or everyone's you're all seated all, everyone's all staring at each other so you've got a partner you partner up Standing. with a stranger no sitting down sitting down but in the other forms of breath work? Everything else is lying down. Lying yeah. down, yeah. yeah. And then once you do do the eye gazing, you do get to lie down. Yes, yeah, so so after not that. And how long does an average session go for? Uh, active breathing is about 45 minutes, I would say. The whole class is about 60 minutes. Yeah, yeah the whole class hour. starts to end is an hour. And for people that have probably not done any breath work before, they might think breathing for 45 minutes, but it is a workout. 
Yeah, or well, it's I, hard. LSD, I wouldn't say as a workout, but connection and um. But the even if we style. look at like something like Wim Hof, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. not sure what your opinions are of it, but yeah, I love Wim like, Hof. People are so. It's hard work. Yeah. yeah. It, it is. really is hard work. It is. It is a lot. We do we do some um, performance based classes. We've got a few AFL teams coming in and doing privates, but even that like that style of class now, which and that's they're just privates at the moment, but there's lots of long exhales, lots of long breath holds. You're trying to make your exhale go for like 17, 18 seconds. Yeah. And that's like really sitting with the air hunger. It's yeah. really like and that sort of stuff is like increasing VO2 max, increasing lung capacity, increasing your tolerance to low CO2, uh, to high CO2, sorry, in, yep. your, in your blood and your body. Um, so there's that side of it too, which is like, that's a real workout where you're trying to... It's a funny trick that plays on you, isn't it? Because yeah. you get every single urge is like, I'm going to die. Yeah. But you don't actually need the oxygen. That's right. It's, it's, it's putting yourself in a controlled state of stress mm. where, you know, if you're... Same as an ice bath. That's right. If you're in a long breath hold for, for two, two and a half minutes... While you're in that breath hold, your oxygen levels are dropping, your CO2 levels are rising. It's the same as when you're fatigued at the end of a game or, you know, you're, you're highly stressed and your breathing goes really shallow. Your CO2 levels are, are rising, your, your body's pumping full of CO2 and it's getting your body used to being, like you said, being like, I'm, it's okay, like I'm not going to die. Mm. Your heart rate stays lower, you don't get that heightened feeling of like, I'm, I'm stuffed here. It's like, no, like I'm okay. Your body naturally breathes a bit deeper. You, you get So much of that's to do with your internal dialogue. hundred percent. Like I, I was talking to one of my clients the other day and their, their excuse for what they hadn't done or something was something to do with drinking filled with water. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's not hard. They said, it, they said, oh, it's just hard. So what's fucking hard about going to the supermarket yeah. and buying a box of cask water? If you say something's going to be hard, it will be hard. That's right. Like you have to be your own coach in those moments to be like, I'm okay. Exactly right. Mm. Exactly right. It's putting yourselves in those situations. And then in terms of what we do, it's like just, just sometimes doing things that you don't want to do, but then you don't, it, those practices don't get any easier. It doesn't get any easier to do a two you minute breath hold. Stronger, yeah. It doesn't get any easier to jump in an ice bath for three no, minutes. It doesn't, it doesn't get any easier to get yourself up off the couch and walk down to the supermarket and buy fresh groceries. But, you just get better at it and you form habits and your body gets more resilient to those practices. Couldn't agree more. Which just, you know, permeates into other areas of life. You become more robust as a human. Couldn't agree more. So that's the thing. It's 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 like choose your hard and then those hards get better and better. You get better and better. You just get used to doing hard things. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. It comes this normal. This is my favorite thing to say. say. This is my favorite thing to say to clients, like at the end of a session or on the beach, I guess, when we do the free ice baths. It's like people come down and they get all excited about doing a free ice bath and then no one goes home and has a cold shower and they're like, Oh no, cold showers are too hard and then I'm like, Okay, but do you get stressed? Like, do you tell yourself that you're a stressed person? And they sit there and they all shake their heads. And then I'm like, so how do you think you're going to handle the stress of the outside world if you can't tell your body that you're okay in a cold shower? Like, what, what, how does that make sense? Like, if you can't sit in the cold shower and tell yourself that you're fine and understand that it sucks for everyone, but that's why we do it, then how can you expect the stresses in your life to just magically go away? Like, you, you get better at it. You get mm. better at handling the overwhelming feelings. Yeah, and the stresses will never go. Like, th that's life. Like, there's going to be... Worse. There's going to be stresses everywhere. Like you literally can't. I almost can't think enough, but there's too many people that don't have enough stress. Yeah, yeah. These days, it's like fuck, sensitive, and like your problems are what you make them. Get yeah. a real one. That's right. That's right. And it's you, you, you never run. Like things will, things will always pop up. Life's always going to be a roller coaster, and it's just literally how, like you said, how you adapt to it. The internal monologue, the practices you put in place that permeate throughout your life, and mm -hmm. things don't, you know, phase you as much. The stresses and the and the bad things. So. I think the most beautiful thing about the cold, which is obviously a great environment to practice your breath work, is just its unique ability to snap people into the present. Yeah. As you said, you're used to going a million mile an hour, but when you are freezing cold, it's very hard to think about what else is going on in your life other, right. than, other than being cold. Try not to die <laughs> in an ice bath. Which kind of is that love-hate relationship that maybe many of us form with it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I, I do too. I'm now. actually, like, I'm, I'm a bit scared to get back into it because I, since I've injured my knee for the for a while i couldn't bend my knee enough to get into my ice yeah. bath and since then i've returned to it so I've, enough time's gone past where i've got that anxiousness and that nervousness yeah. knowing that 
I need to go through. It's no different to having time off the gym. That's right. Your first two, three weeks, everything sucks. It hurts. You get sore. You feel weak. You're sore for a you whole feel, week. <laughs> you feel fatigued from the session rather than energized by it. And you've got to get over that hurdle again. So it's going to be the same same thing with the ice bath again yeah, soon. That's right. You've got to stick You got to stick out these practices and like build those habits. Because, yeah, like you said, you're... It's like breath work as well. Like if the people that come regularly see the most benefits because they're always just teaching their brain. They're always keeping up to date. If you come for one class and then miss a whole month and then come to another class, it's like, yeah, you're getting the initial benefits from the actual practice. But unless you put, unless you, you know, cons- you come to your consistent come with it, yeah. unless you're consistent with it. Yeah. You don't, you don't see those exponential gains. You're always, you know, you come to a class and then you slowly taper off, come to a class. But if you're coming regularly, it's like the gym, you come and then you, the more consistent you are, you see the results. So if you were to try and say to somebody, like if there was a goal, what would their goal be for the session? Is it, can, can you put that as black and white as that? Well, I think that it's, um, I think that every session you come with a different intention. Like for me, sometimes when I practice breath work, which to be fair, I haven't been doing enough of it, but it's just sitting in the discomfort of staying still mm-hmm. and like not moving. And every single time my mind goes, oh, you have to do this. It's like, no, come back to what you're doing right now. So that is sometimes the intention, I guess. But then also some people come because they want to release and they want to cry and they want to like sweat and feel high and like dizzy and not dizzy, but like that. What's it called? Like I know what you mean though. You know, that, 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 that like high feeling that, that you get ting. in your body. You're almost yeah. like you're floating. Yeah. yeah, it feels like you've taken a drug. Like mm. I don't know what I do know a few drugs that it might be like, but I'm like, it feels like you've taken a drug. Um, some people come with that intention of feeling that. And then other times people just come because they want the breath holds and the vibrations in their mm. body. And some people want the after feeling and some people want... I guess the clarity that comes with sitting with themselves or so do, I guess do you think no there's a um, like I know that you said in your first experience that it kind of felt like it was five minutes and it went by and there was you know it was an hour of nothingness but do you think there's a little bit of a, a fallacy in the belief from the general population that whether it be meditations or breath work is going to be exactly that like a Buddhist monk floating there with a thoughtless meditation because if anything, I reckon one of the most powerful things I've been taught is to just disassociate anything from good or bad. Rather, it is, it is if your emotion, if you need to be sad, you need to be sad. Mm. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And you are, n- you know, your thoughts and you are not your feelings, right? So rather the opportunity, and when you start to understand that the subconscious mind has something like 60,000 thoughts per day, 96% of them being subconscious, well, then I can actually sit here and come from an observational point of view and go oh i wonder why that is there and then we can go through the fun exploration process of go c- trying to connect these dots of where that thought originated from so that we can actually do something with that hard drive clean out you know what i mean that's right like we and one of the one of the cues that Ali uses in a in a sessions is like get curious about what you're feeling get curious about the thoughts that come into your head because and also the thoughts and the feelings are all temporary that's right so you're sitting there and you're going you're almost in not so, so much of an out-of-body experience but you something will pop up and you'll be like, okay, like observe it, but it's not you. Don't it's get attached to it. Don't get attached to it. And and then you feel in your body and you go, oh, wow, like my hands are starting to really tingle. Like just getting curious about that stuff. Because like you said, like you are not your feelings. Like imagine them like clouds in the sky and they, they fly away. Like it's like well, you they're said, not real. Fear and excitement is the exact same thing. That's right. That's right. It's it Again, it comes back to like the internal dialogue of what you're telling yourself. Yeah. Um, it's a choice. That's right. And, and, we find in our practices at the breath house, like people understand that the more times they come in and put themselves in that stressed environment and they go, oh, okay, like my, I can do this to make my body do that. I, you know, these thoughts are temporary. Like I feel so good after this. It's literally b- just becoming more robust as humans and connecting in with yourself. And yeah, like just seeing how much more powerful you are than what you're telling yourself. And also another thing, coming back to the Buddhist monk comment, I just have to talk about one thing. People, I think, have this idea that like breath work is going to be chimes and like sound bowls, which sound bowls, don't get me wrong, I love a sound bowl. And we a do DJ love a sound bowl. bowl. Mm. Um, but it's not like what you think it is. It's like you, the one of the most common messages that I got from like the first big bulk of people that would come and they were just like absolute crazy breathers was always the playlist and always the music. And they were like, I didn't expect Jay-Z and like I Jay Cole and everything. I do believe that you've actually stolen some of my music. In the past. <laughs> I have, I have. Yeah. I've got some Thank of your you. mushy um, playlists, oh, actually. Thank you very much. throw me under. Oh, yeah. yeah, there you go. Chuck it's been out. a while since I've done mushies, yeah. actually. Well, I've, I've got some of your playlists from there. But, uh, but like people have this like idea that it's going to be all, ooh, and it's not. You lay down and I'm playing Love Yours and bloody. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's very cool. Like it's that's, that's one thing that we really wanted to 
we don't want it to be like that whole cliche. Mm, yeah. Yeah. We want it to be like the perfect mix of me being magical and metaphysical, and you can't put words to it, and then Nathan being like, yeah, very fun. You know, we're, we're finding a lot. A lot of guys are coming in now, and it's it's sort of. Last night's class I've was actually got guys. Um, yeah. So my co-host for my other episodes of the podcast and good friend Mikhail Yahaya. So he's a black belt in jujitsu. Yep. And I was talking to him the other day when we we're recording, and we're doing another one this afternoon. So we're going to try and get a couple of the jujitsu guys, and we'll come down for our first session. Awesome. Ah, and, and then let yeah. me know when you want to do one on one. I will. Yeah, yeah I've got I a will. good playlist for you. I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. Yeah, it's it, it's just like I I sort of looked at the industry from an outsider and gone. It's very like, it's very niche where a lot of um, breath work and, you know, other companies or facilitators or whatnot. It's niche, but it's also very broad. Yeah, it's because you're for everybody. That's right. You said it yourself. If you've got a set of lungs. That's, and that's what we really play into. It's like we, we obviously love our, our, you know, the diehards, the people that are into breath work. They love it. They're really highly spiritual. But then it's 80% of the population, like me and you, or people who've never heard of breath work. It's like, okay, like it's not this Buddhist monk. We're not sitting there, you know, meditate. It's like, come in it's you and your body it's whatever like we're just sort of like normalizing it making it a bit more mainstream not just hoo-ha yeah just not making it as scary i don't love who i'm hoo-ha through and through yeah everything has a time and a place that's right but it's 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 reducing the barrier of entry so people look at it and go okay like i can see um jack going down and doing a session i can see an afl footballer going down and doing a session and they go okay like it knocks down some of those this is for everyone yeah it's not it's not just the you know the hippie-ish type people that you know which we love but it's not the byron bay not the byron not bay, bay not the byron bay <laughs> spiritual tarot Death cards but yeah that's right <laughs> that's it's funny. Fit, yeah it's 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 uh, making it accessible for everyone and making it yeah normal no, that's really cool you so know what i want to talk about before that i'm going to interrupt you and say no, because i fine. really want to share it because i always forget to talk about this the reason like the second that i knew that this is what i had to do with my life was i had this client and she was actually one of my first lash clients when i first started doing lashes and she was like, when I first did my first course, she was my test dummy. She was the first person I ever ran through a one-on-one. And I remember laying her down. And this woman had been on, had a, had a very big story as well. Like lots of things happened to her and a lot of unprocessed emotions. And basically she'd been going back and forth to the doctor for her whole entire life since her mum had passed away maybe 10 years before I spoke to her for the first time, right? I imagine how unhelpful that would have been. <laughs> yeah, and she was put on every single anti-anxiety, antidepressant, sleeping tablets, Valium throughout the day, this, this, and this. And then the first thing I did when I said lay down was I said, take a deep breath. And she just went, and I went, no, take a deep breath in through your nose into your belly. And she went, and I was like, breathe into your belly. And she's like, I, I am. And I was like, no, you're not. And no one had ever looked at her breathing. Like she oh, went back it. and forth to the doctor, which I know you know, because you have the same opinions as I do about this kind of crap. But like, not crap, you know what I mean? But like, she sat there and she just, and I taught her how to breathe into her belly. And she is unrecognizable now. She's not on anything. She now has her own breathwork studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, like not a breath, but like a, like a wellness sort of studio. And she's now a facilitator as well. And she's completely changed careers because... Yeah. All she needed to do was learn how to breathe into her belly and learn how to use her nose. I do a very similar party trick when we run seminars in the past where we get someone to actually face one another yeah. and I get them to cross their arms. Mm-hmm. So it's parallel with the floor. Yeah. And then I just say, I want you to pay attention to one another and take a deep breath. And if the elbows yeah. go up, we know that their breathing's fucked. That's right. Basically Shallow you, breathing. Your, your, your elbows and arms should not be moving that's, that's right a good one. yeah i never thought about that because they're engaging the muscles of their upper of back class. yeah you can steal that <laughs> thank you see the video is in class that's a good one yeah you'll see us now <laughs> no good uh, use it but we, it is we, true i didn't fucking invent it i learned it from somewhere yeah it is very true it's it, like i sort of say it to the boy sometimes like it's called vertical breathing and it's very upper chest shallow Whereas you want to breathe outwards, like you want to expand your ribs and your diaphragms. Like mm. it's putting your hands under your ribs and exactly trying it. to push your hands out. But no I, ex- I doing teach that. people with um, weight belts, right? So you see a lot of people in gyms with weight yeah. belts. I'm like, weight belts don't keep your back safe. Yeah. It's just, like I said, the connection between your brain and your diaphragm can somewhat be, you know, a little bit compromised. And so if you actually touch it, it helps create that neurological connection. That's right. So your weight belt is pushing in there against your diaphragm, what you should be doing is filling that up with air yeah. and actually pushing the weight belt out, trying to burst it open. That's what's going to give you the intra-abdominal pressure. That's what's going to give you the rigidity around the spine so that you can actually stabilize your pelvis and squat without back pain. That's right, 100%, 100%. It's that, it's, and even once people come in and they, and they learn how to, 
breathe properly, like that that they go from here to here straight away, and then yeah, they can and then immediate. they and then they can unlock all the other benefits because you're getting you know more um, you know the volume of air increases that you can breathe the. Your um, body just feels safe. Yeah. Like all these people, like for me as well, I was always on, I was chasing every other feeling. I was constantly in a doctor. There was always something wrong with me. I was always trying to get something else to just like uh, be ex- like waiting for them to fix what I was feeling. Yeah. And then I did that breathwork session. I was like, hold on. And then when I saw this, my first client ever breathe into her chest and I knew her story because I'd been lashing her for years. I was like, this doesn't make sense. It is so powerful. I just, it's just come to me, this sort of memory while I was with um one of my mates and he's, um, daughters at the playground like two weeks ago and she hurt herself on one of the apparatuses or something and she was crying so I went and picked her up and I just was looking in the eyes I was like take a big breath she goes one more oh and the tears were stopped yeah. straight away yeah. straight away yeah. it's powerful it is very powerful so, so powerful. do you guys because I know this is again the common advice which probably falls a little bit into the cliche stuff and a bit unrealistic, I find, for a lot of people, dependent on the, the individual and the lifestyle, that, you know, the whole morning routine of wake up and you're going to meditate for half an hour and do your breath work and then you go out and t- do your day. And I get morning routines and these sort of things are, are helpful, but you can see how it's not practical for a lot of people in our life. Do you guys do any specific stuff for yourselves in terms of, like, morning routines or circumstantial when you decide to implement breathwork strategies evening? I don't so know. Most because you do your classes. I want to say five mornings a week. This morning I didn't because I was at the studio until nine last night and got back there at six. So I didn't do too much myself this morning. But um, most mornings I'll start by doing at least two rounds of fire breath. So that like takes five minutes if that. And Describe then I will fire breath. Fire breath is, oh, I feel like I might be snotty, but it's just is that like breathing a bellow, in? breathing in and out. So it's like no emphasis on the in, a huff on the exhale. So it's like you're kind of like trying to push into a, like a... So that yeah. noise that's coming out, is that the exhale or the inhale? The exhale. Okay. So it's like a huff out. Right. It's a little, that's the exhale. Um, I do that followed by two deep breaths by an exhale, two deep breaths, then an exhale hold. Okay, then do it super slow. Hold. And then two really big deep breaths. And then hold on the exhale for my max and then hold on the inhale for my max. And then I'll and get then into return a to the Then uh, I do the bellows again. And how many of them do you do? 50. Yeah, cool. Takes me five minutes, not yep. even. And then I get into a cold shower. But the cold shower always starts hot and then ends cold. Yeah, I know. I do the same. Yeah, and so I do that most mornings. Okay. I feel like the memory just came back. I remember we did that fire breathing in the sauna one time before I went oh, to that then first I class. Out. Yeah. It can be intense, the fire breathing, not fire breathing, yeah. but just any I breathing in the sauna because of just sometimes how hot it gets yeah. in the sinuses. Yeah. We were in the we were in the sauna with our best friend and Nate's business partner, and I was sitting in between both of them, and we were doing fire breath. And I did like I think we were maybe on to our third or fourth round. I did my exhale hold for the max effort, and I just remember coming back, and I was like, I have no idea where I am. I was like thinking to myself, It's all right, you'll come figure it out in a second. And I was like, I have no idea where I am. <laughs> it's getting very competitive. And then I was in like, the <laughs> You don't want to pass out in a sauna, man. Oh and then no I was way. like, Oh. Okay, I'm hot. And then I like opened my eyes and I got straight out and I was just like laying on the floor. I was like, probably push it a bit hard there. <laughs> it's like funny how competitive <laughs> the, like I'll, I'll have a few, I'll, I'll name him, Cody Waitman. He's a good mate of mine. Um, I plays, banned him from doing breath Plays for, for the Western long. Bulldogs. Like w- w- sometimes we won't let go. Oh, sometimes we're in <laughs> classes together and like literally I'll get my watch out and we've got the timer going and like almost breathing, uh, almost not breathing till we pass. Yeah, it gets so competitive. How long can you do it for? Oh, I reckon I've done. Cody can go for nearly four minutes. Yeah. That's impressive. I reckon yeah. I've done, I would have done close to that mm. in a few classes. Is that on the exhale or an inhale? Uh, uh, in, in, oh, I love an exhale. I love an inhale hold. You but can you hold it for longer on an inhale. Yeah. I can anyway. Yeah. But it's an exhale hold maybe, I don't know, towards the end of a, of a no, intense session. That's Cody. Cody yeah, co- like yeah Cody for minutes. sure, yeah. Oh, I'd I probably find be. when I do Wim Hof, for example, my first couple rounds are terrible yeah mm. but it's almost again that right there is a feedback to me of how important it is that i'm doing this right now yeah because my uh, it might take me three or four rounds to get anywhere yeah and then once i start stretching into sort of five six seven eight rounds like it really exponentially turns up for me where i'm sort of breaking into the three minute marks but the first two or three yep I'll be struggling to get past a minute and a half. You're almost waiting for your body to drop into the, the, the feelings and the 
and it's just mm. priming your body up for those breath holds. Yeah. And for women as well in their cycle, their breath hold capacity changes with their cycle. And I wouldn't ever suggest to do anything hectic when they're bleeding. It's just not it. Your body's already well. That's your body's under stress, yeah. so that, mm. that makes sense. It's enough. Like, that's like typically very slow, delicious breathing when you're doing that. Which is usually nutritionally why w- I will tell women that when they start menstruating that that's typically when they can tolerate a, a few more carbohydrates as well mm-hmm. because there's going to be an inverse relationship there between the insulin and the cortisol i actually only learned about my cycle at the end of last year and i've started to actually live with my cycle and it is life-changing not just living in like this masculine driven world and like being like okay no i'm not doing that on today and i'm not doing that now and i'm ovulating now so let me go yeah i'm always <laughs> learning more and more about it and it's it's fascinating some of the one of the more recent ones that i've sort of connected the dots with with um women in their menstrual cycles is sometimes that unilateral work is actually not going to be What's the unilateral work? like single leg. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. So stuff where you're going to get a lot of rotation through the sacroiliac joint of the pelvis yeah. and stuff can be aggravating when estrogen is really high. Mm. So to change some of your training methodologies around where they are in their menstrual cycle as well. I mean, the, the common approach is usually that, well, estrogen is anabolic for a woman, just like testosterone is for a man. Mm. So you're going to tailor your training around sort of heavier compound lifts, strength training, lower volume, longer rest periods. Mm. And then as you actually progress further through your cycle, you're going to be more primed for fat burning in a way. And you can probably start to drift towards more, not necessarily higher repetitions, but maybe more metabolic work and perhaps some cardio stuff. I hope that with time, this is just like something that's really normalized between women, like understanding their cycle. Because at the moment, I say it to some of my girlfriends still, and they're like, what do you mean? Well, some of the stuff, science doesn't favor women. Like so many of the clinical studies on anything are always done on male subjects. And we are profoundly different in many ways. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. One of the other things I think is really cool about the breath that the listeners should... um, would appreciate hearing about is like the connection to your breathing and probably i don't know if i'd say your immune system but rather the likelihood of you getting sick or having allergies right because the nose is is a filtration system Mm -hmm. okay it's taking out the air pollutants Mm -hmm. it's actually heating up the air in the sinuses for you to be able to breathe whereas if you're breathing through your mouth you're obviously bypassing that full filtration system and more likely going to get pollutants and tonsillitis Mm -hmm. and bronchitis and all these kind of dental hygiene everything yeah Yeah, for sure yeah it's that's exa- you hit the nail on the head. The, the nose is a natural filter for the body, and we always our nose is the most underrated organ ever. That's right, and 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 we always say like mouth breathing while sleeping is probably one of the like you sleep for what eight yeah, hours a day. Yeah, we haven't even spoken about mouth. Yeah, you? it's it's like it's if you can breathe through your nose for your eight hours of sleep, it's mm. your your body is getting you know better quality air because it's getting filtered through your nose. You're getting um, more REM sleep. More REM sleep. It's deeper. You're getting more volume of breath. Um, into your body it, you're more parasympathetic which is obviously the rest and digest um it just sort of like flow it flows on like the, it's so underrated you like nose breathing especially during sleep and the connection there the thing that i like with the the rem sleep right so we're we're connecting dots here so you're breathing through your nose you get more rem sleep now we're tying into healing from trauma yes. in a way because we get to relive yeah. those traumatic experiences without the adrenal secretion and like anything when you're exposed to it in you know frequency the air comes out of the tires mm-hmm. and that goes in arousal and that goes in desensitization that's right yeah and it's and it's not just the mental and you know emotional gains as well it's a, there's so much physical changes my in the body mouth, as well my jaw is completely changed if you look at a photo of me from a site oh yeah i've lost a bit of weight but my jaw structure has completely changed since i've started well yeah you see the photos of people that have got the turkey neck looking yeah it's our favorite thing to show people yeah it is my yeah, yeah that'll scare people. anyone yeah yeah but also like i have when i remember when i first read breath by james nesta in the start of 2020 and I remember he suggested mouth taping and I was thinking, and I was a crazy person then. No one was talking about that at the start of 2020. Like no one in my circle anyway. Mm. I mouth taped the first night mm. and I thought to myself, I'm not going to be able to sleep with it on the whole night. And from my like little Britney Spears moment to then finding breath work six months later and then finding mouth tape like another, what, a month later maybe, I still was having a lot of trouble sleeping. The first night that I mouth taped, I slept for like eight hours without waking up. And I used to tell myself I had to go to the toilet like three times yeah, a night. A lot of people but need I to piss wa- more because mm. they're breathing through their mouth. Yeah. yeah. Liter- and I just, w- I slept and I was like, holy shit, this is like having a sleeping tablet. I wish I found it a lot sooner because these days I sleep pretty well and breathe through my nose. So when I've taped my mouth, it hasn't really yeah. changed much for me. Yeah, but, but if I look a back, not, not so much, but if I did it, let's say four years ago when I was probably 10 kilos heavier and had a neck or well, didn't have a neck 
and was probably snoring and getting apnea and stuff, I probably would have noticed the profound effects. Necklace days build character, more. though. Hey, <laughs> they build character. <laughs> necklace days. What are you talking <laughs> about? When you don't. When you're like necklace a little bit days. Yeah, when you don't, when you're a little bit chunkier, so you don't have such a neck, so you could have really be funny. Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> gotta be, it was, it was character thick. building. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, nah, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's crazy how, and we, we get all our mates to do it now. Yeah, all my friends um, mouth tape. Yeah, and and people still think you're crazy. Like I'll send clients in, like like after they've done a one on one, and I'll be like, okay, cold showers, you're mouth taping, and you're doing this, this, and this. And they go into the chemist and they're like, oh, yeah, I just need my micropore tape. And then so many messages. They don't realise that you don't need to do it like you're fucking kidnapping someone. That's yeah. right. You've yeah. got to put a little bit, uh, yeah. just like the a little reminder. Little but, but they always go, I'm just going to get the pharmacist for you to just have a chat about that. And like, Oh, yeah, I heard you mention that maybe <laughs> recently. What, <laughs> be, because someone said, oh, I'm getting it I just want to take my mouth to, my yeah, mouth. to sleep. And then they literally they take them to the pharmacist to make them unpack what they're doing because they're worried about their safety. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so funny. <laughs> I've had the same thing when I've because I've I get a few sinus issues sometimes I've been hitting the nose a lot yeah and I get so buy a nasal spray I'm like mate I'm not cooking drugs out of a fucking nasal yeah. spray I just don't want to have to come back all the time let me take a couple buy five nasal sprays yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. they won't let me take more than one at a time <laughs> yeah yeah no we find it's it's pretty common amongst you know guys our age especially like sports people and athletes there's we see a lot of like sinus issues been hit the nose like nose ricos and broken noses and stuff like that and yeah we see a lot of that and and it's teaching and and then that just sort of you know hab habitually makes guys mouth breathe more if they've had trauma for their nose mm. um and so it's teaching them to get function back to their nose and breathing and get them back into that state it's one of, it's part of the um one of the things that i've sort of learned to love about jujitsu since I've sort of made that transition from like really heavy weight training and still doing some strength stuff, but you know, it wasn't serving me. So going into the jujitsu space, and I remember when I first did it, like any time that your skill is inefficient, you're going to chew up a lot of energy. Yeah. Plus, you know, there's a fairly big aerobic component to it. And Ivan would be like, shut that fucking mouth. <laughs> when yeah. we're like rolling together, I'm here <laughs> breathing. And now you start to realize, you know, after you've put a couple of years in, and you're just, it's all about just composure. And yeah. they, they, they nickname it, the Brazilian guys, they call it like yoga for tough guys. And so you're there just trying to actually compose your breath and, you know, you get your rest where you can and it's, it becomes this very yoga, meditative and very intimate because, yeah. you know, you're there sweating with another man face to face and grappling one another. And, and you know at the end of that session who's got the biggest dick in the room, metaphorically. Yep. Yep. And then that creates a pretty... Uh, again, unique environment where there's comfort to be vulnerable if someone wants to talk about their life because you've just you've just let it all out. No one needs to pretend to be tough anymore yep. because it might be the toughest person in the room, but they're the one that's ha having a bad time and they're confiding in you about it. You know, so that's right. like sort of the unexpected things that I think have been really beautiful about you know finding jujitsu yeah. ties in with the breath. I've had a lot of uh, uh, I love you know UFC Israel Adesanya. He mm -hmm. he's a massive you know fan of breath work and what the, it can do for the body like go yeah know, well he's, he's kind of like your modern fighter you yeah know? he's your modern fighter but again like you say it's like the nature of fighting or whether it's grappling or whatever it's so combative it's very mask it's very you know go 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 but yeah the toughest guy in the room is, is the nicest, guy, is the nicest is guy and the guy that's most centered and the most in tune with his body and in tune with his environment and if you watch, you know, Adesanya's fight, he, there's some good YouTube videos on it. And at the start of rounds or he's just standing there, nose breathing, climbing himself back down. He's looking over the other guy's mouth breathing and he's just getting in touch with his body, connected to his body. You, it, there's so much studies to say, like you, your spatial awareness skyrockets, your, um, your sort of attention really focuses in. Um, there's so much benefit to when you're in that environment, it's like a, you're almost meant to be in a fight or flight situation, whether you're in a fight with a, another man or, or woman, or you're out in the footy field in front of a hundred thousand people on the G, mm. you, your body wants to go into fight or flight. It's such a heightened I know state. exactly what you mean. It's like you, how many times when you think you're tired and you're fucked, yeah. that you're actually not. Yeah. It's just what you're telling yourself. And if you can get that, it might take you two or three breaths to get that first 
full one in. Yep. But once you get the full one in, you're like, oh, I'm actually all right. That's right, yeah. It, br- it brings you back to your surroundings. It grounds you. And like the I said before... The lactic acid disappears a bit. That's a big... That's actually a really big part of a, a few studies I've been looking at where the lactic acid buffering in terms of your mm-hmm. breathing, like everyone talks about as athletes, like hitting the wall is so common where you're just so stuffed in what you're doing. But that's because your body's not getting as much oxygen, oxygen yeah. to flush out those acid buildups in, in your muscles. So there's heaps of that. There's, there's studies to suggest that, you know, EPO production following a strong breath hold classes skyrockets for the three hours post. And that's obviously, you know, your body's ability to produce red blood cells, transport oxygen around the body. Um, and people think of EPO and all these types of things. And it's like, you know, people, you know, don't people inject that or don't, it's like, no, blood you can, doping, get, you can yeah. get this naturally. Like yeah. this is, EPO is, is, is a natural hormone for, bo- for your body and you can produce it naturally um, following, you know, structured breath hold classes. So there's so much science to say have in terms ever, of performance. Have you ever tried blood flow restriction training? Yes, I have, yeah. That's painful. It's so painful. I'm doing it at the moment because of my knee injury. It's perfect for me. So pretty much what you do is you use tourniquets to occlude or, and restrict the blood flow. So you flow. cut off blood flow to a, a yeah, body Yeah, I part. figured that, but yeah. like, what's the point? Because then when you're injured and you can't obviously tolerate heavy loads... Mm. it kind of internally creates like a heavy weight training environment without using heavy weight. It also builds up a lot of these um, metabolic and lactate, pr- um, like lactic, lactic acid and these um, metabolites mm. because of the blood flow, but then it prevents venous return to the heart. So you keep it uh, occluded for like a 10, 15 minute period, do high repetitions, short rest periods, um, and it's shown to sort of create hypertrophy. And there even... The, c- the coolest thing about it is, uh, I've only just recently read this in a new study that you'd think because that's quite isolated to your limbs because you can't really occlude your chest or mm. your ass. But this research is showing that even if you've got blood flow restriction on your legs and you're doing squats, for example, that it still is helping stimulate hypertrophy in the glutes even though they're not restricted. Don't know how, can't tell you that, but cool nonetheless. Yeah, it's very cool. That's been a wrap, I reckon, guys. Wonderful. That's, good. A, that's a good chat about this is the our first podcast together. First one together, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to... Uh, Thanks for inviting me. I was a last minute in. invite. I'm happy I got in. <laughs> yeah, it made sense. I couldn't fucking avoid you. I kept running into you at 132, you know? Just knock, yeah. knock it off. Our sponsors, off the list. again, we'll shout, shout out them out while we're here. The best cafe in the Chapel Street Precinct. 100%. It is 100%. You'll find all three of us there multiple times a day. Every, that's our office, actually. You can guarantee that no matter what time of the day, if it's before one o'clock, you'll find one of the three Sammy, of us Sammy's going to start invoicing us for rent because we just take <laughs> up that back table all day. Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> I walked in there the other day and saw you guys there and was talking for about five minutes and yeah. didn't even realise Reese was there. The, the yeah. whole the whole club's hanging right. out down there. It's yeah. good. It's so, guys, good where can uh, people find you on their socials? Uh, on house? the breath house underscore. And, and that's house H H A U S. Yeah. Oh, the not double A. Yeah, it's very German. Yeah, it's yes. very German. H A U S underscore on Instagram. Um, the breath boss. I'm just Nate Freeman Ten. My individual personal Instagram. But yeah, you'll find us at the breath house. I'll put them all in the show links, guys. So give them a follow. And I would really appreciate it, given that I've just relaunched the podcast and putting a lot of effort into it. That if you like our shit, please like and subscribe on all the platforms, being Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. I want that YouTube money. All right. Ciao. That's a wrap. Good job.